Having outlined the general conception of the warrior and having traced in however cursory a fashion uh, its historical instantiation, we must turn ourselves to considering the status of the warrior today. As I said at the outset, the figure of the warrior is one that sits rather uncomfortably for us. And that, of course, is because contemporary Western societies are rather less comfortable with martial values and the celebration of killing than some of their predecessors were. Indeed, the way in which we talk about soldiers more generally today is indicative. We are much less likely to celebrate martial prowess than we are to elevate suffering and even victimhood. Indicative of this is uh, the movement of help for heroes and notably the ways in which we speak of heroism. If we went back to Greek mythology and folklore, a hero was originally a demigod, which is to say the offspring of a mortal and a deity. Heracles, Perseus and indeed Achilles are all in this sense heroes. They were individuals who were literally uh, distinct from common humanity. They possessed something of the divine in them. They had extraordinary powers. Today, we attribute the term of heroes more commonly to soldiers who have suffered and endured in the context of war. Or as Christopher Coker puts it, we glorify soldiers because of the situations they face, not their actions. Now, one of the reasons for this might be that we live in much more egalitarian societies that refuse to or are reluctant to elevate individuals above others. The warrior, after all, is an inherently elitist concept, uh, a notion of particular individuals being superior to others that is obviously historically tied into ideas of aristocracy and social hierarchy. And so this reluctance to talk of warriors and heroes in this traditional fashion may have to do with notions of a civilianization of the military um, that we discussed last week. Um, the influence of post-military developments, if you want. It's also true that we live in a world in which death is scarcer and less visible than in the past. Our societies have experienced dramatic decreases in childhood mortality. Uh, we live much longer lives. And even where mortality comes in, uh, death itself is uh, hospitalized, removed from view. Uh, it is not as commonly experienced or visible. Additionally, we live in highly risk-averse societies in, in which the minimization of risk is one of its paramount objectives. All of this may explain why death at war is much more intolerable to us, why we refuse to value meaning in death and sacrifice, why every, why every death is first and foremost maybe exclusively framed in terms of tragedy. This also informs the way in which we see soldiers frequently as damaged and vulnerable individuals who are in need of post-conflict mandatory counselling. And of course, while post-traumatic stress disorder is very real, it's the focus on it also tends to obscure the enduring appeals of war. As one US infantryman put it, people back home think we drink because of the bad stuff. But that's not true. We drink because we miss the good stuff. And indeed, it is that thrill 
the visceral experience of war that uh, we cannot forget. The film The Hurt Locker is in fact a film about this thrill of war, uh, in which we're presented with a central protagonist who is in a sense addicted to war, one who subsequently struggles to reassimilate into uh, civilian life, whose humdrum domesticity uh, cannot meet, cannot match the elevated sense of existence experienced out in the field. Note, however, that the film still chooses as its central character a bomb disposal expert. That is to say, an individual whose primary purpose is to save lives, is to detonate bombs, not to take lives. Perhaps because the filmmakers felt that the audience would better relate to uh, such a character rather than to a more conventional warrior whose main objective is, or main skill, is to take lives. But perhaps one of the other very significant developments that have made the figure of the warrior much more precarious and much diminished in the contemporary context has to do with the progressive technologization of war. The ways in which the pursuit of armed conflict is increasingly conceptualized as the performance of vast socio-technical systems in which individuals are understood to be technicians endowed with limited agency who perform small tasks within a larger machinery. In addition to this, these modern systems typically create considerable distance between uh, soldiers and their opponents. The drone pilot being emblematic in this regard. The mutual risk that would involve traditional warriors meeting on the battlefield, the mutual exposure to death is absent, of course, when one side is remotely piloting aircraft thousands of miles away. This accordingly reduces the requirement for courage and valor, which have typically been thought to be essential to the warrior spirit. Technology also reduces the need for conventional warrior skills emphasizing the technical and cerebral. Karl Marx had already asked in the 19th century whether Achilles was still possible with gunpowder and lead. In 2003, DARPA the Research and Development Branch of the US Army, produced a report in which it explained that with the infusion of technology into the modern theater of war, the human has become the weakest link, both physiologically and cognitively. And indeed, it is through a variety of means, the development of chemicals, brain machine interfaces, various cybernetic systems that, the, that operatives such as DARPA have been seeking to reduce human uncertainty, to subsume individuals as cogs within broader military machines. In this view, courage and commitment are mere expressions of genes, chemical balances, neuroscientific activity no longer can they be associated with 
some individual commitment or exertion of agency. The question that remains for us is whether we should bemoan this in any way. Whether warriors, in a sense, are still needed. Perhaps they are merely a romantic, antiquated, archaic ideal that we should readily dispense with. Well, there's perhaps a few reasons why we might still need to care about warriors. One is a more practical, perhaps even instrumental one, which is that in the contemporary uh, landscape of war, we see a greater role presently for special forces, for highly professionalized units, in cases where high-tech means are not necessarily as effective, and where the kinds of individuals who might be those natural born warriors are likely to be needed. But there is perhaps a more fundamental reason why we might still want or need warriors, which has to do with the question of what comes instead, of what war becomes when war is merely waged by robots or by humans so programmed as to virtually be robots. Will we have, will we have a net improvement? Will war become more moral, more humane when we remove the human? Some advocates of automation roboticization, artificial intelligence, claim that programming the laws of war into machines will make for more ethical wars because these machines will not be prone to emotion, to instability, to fatigue, uh, and to their judgment being clouded. They will rigorously follow the laws of war. Well, whether you buy into this or not really depends to some extent how you view the moral and ethical problems that face us in war. Whether they are in fact likely to throw up dilemmas that cannot be resolved unambiguously and therefore have to be adjudicated by individuals who have to make commitments normative commitments, ethical commitments that will resonate for the rest of their lives or whether ethical normative problems are ones that can be unambiguously solved by an algorithm. But beyond that, there is the more profound question of whether the disappearance of the warrior and the purely in instrumental understanding of war that would follow would not in fact entail a dehumanization of war. Glenn Gray observes that brutalization is hardly the worst that can happen to a man, for it can be healed in time and in circumstances of peaceful living. But the man who kills from a distance and without consciousness of the consequences of his deeds, feels no need to answer to anyone or to himself. Disassociated from his deeds, he can become far more monstrous than the infantry soldier or lower inf echelon officer who occasionally goes berserk on the battle strain. In other words, the question for us is whether we want those who take lives in our names to be mere cogs in a machine to be a simple relays for the political will of our states, or whether we see some value in preserving their agency, however fraught and problematic it might be. 
Might it still be that the choice of how we fight remains as important as why we fight? At any rate, it is certain that those, those that we do fight will make their own judgments about us on the basis of how we found, fight. For it inescapably some, says something about who we are and how we view our adversaries. The warrior ethos, whatever its problems, involved some form of intersubjectivity, that is to say, in recognizing equals, in, at least in the form of the warriors that we find on the other side. When we reduce war purely to a technical exercise of political will, will we see those we wage war against as anything else than an obstacle, a hindrance to the exertion of our wills? Does it end up removing from us the moral forms of agency that are perhaps the best restraint, however imperfect, on the bounds of violence we use against each other?